begins at chapter 4 in our third installment in this series of sermons entitled The Worthy Walk. Ephesians at chapter number 4, verses 1 through verse number 6. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6 reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away. But the word of our God shall stand forever. The worthy walk. <clears throat> I beseech you. I implore you. I beg of you to walk worthy. That word worthy in the text means weighty. Walk heavy. Be a heavy Christian. A fat Christian. Not, not in terms of physical size. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. Don't get happy right there. But to be weighty means you can't be pushed around. You, you can't be carried away by every wind of doctrine. You're not easily bowled over. Weighty. Walk worthy. Walk weighty. Walk heavy. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called. And then he says to do it in verse 2 with lowliness and, and meekness and long suffering and forbearance and do it all in love. Uh, that word lowliness uh, is a Christian word that Paul had to make up in order to convey the idea of humility because there is no thought of humility in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, to the Greeks, to be humble meant to be silly, uh, to be stupid. And to the Romans, it meant to be weak and without strength. But humility means to think less of yourself and more of others and come to the point where you don't think of yourself at all but you're always thinking towards the needs of others. And then he says in verse 3, we have to endeavor. We have to put some effort into it. We have to make a concentrated effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You have to endeavor. You have to strive after it. And there is an implicit implication that to endeavor means that if you don't work at it, you can lose it. Uh, if the church does not work at unity, uh, it's fragile and easy to come apart. Uh, you got to work at loving people. You've got to work at being kindly affectioned one towards another. 
Because there are some people who are hard to love. Uh, there are some people who get on your nerves and, and bother you more than you can explain. But as a Christian, you've got to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. And listen, keeping the unity does not mean keeping unity at all costs by tolerating sin. But keeping the unity means guard what the Holy Spirit has put together. Because if the Holy Spirit has not put it together, don't guard what is unholy. Um, there's, there's a problem with unity. And the problem with unity has to do with our diversity. Uh, the problem with the church is people. The good thing about the church is people. The bad thing about the church is people. Church would be a good place to go on Sunday morning if it wasn't for some people. I, I, I wish I could stay right there a minute. But we have to work at keeping the unity. Work at it. You've got to constantly pray that God would even keep you in your right frame of mind during the worship service because the devil will use people to disturb you even in the worship. You got you to keep focused. You got to keep your mind on the word. You've got to keep your mind on Christ because it is not about individuals in the church but it is about the church as a corporate body guarding the unity of the spirit and trying to keep it in the bonds of peace. So Paul has been making a plea for unity. And then Paul has talked to us in verse 3 about the problem of unity. And in verse 2 he gives us a pathway to unity. I talked about lowliness on last Sunday at our 11 o'clock worship. And I want to deal with the other words in this text in, in, in verse number two, which are important as a pathway to help us to endeavor to keep the unity in the bond of peace. The next word in that list of words is the word meekness. Meekness is not to be in any way confused with weakness. We meekness is not weakness. This word meekness does not refer to some namby-pamby, milky toast, tree-hugging, crybaby. Weakness has nothing at all to do with biblical meekness. Meekness, this word comes from the idea of gentleness, of power under control. Power under control. Power that has been harnessed and self-restrained. You're in charge, but you don't lord it over people. You, you have the power, but you bring it under control. Somebody ought to help me preach it. It's the picture of a horse, a wild horse, a huge, powerful horse that lets you ride him. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Uh, uh, an elephant lets you tame him. A lion lets you pull out a whip and a chair. Because if they decide, they can break all of that up. Because they have the power. Have I got a witness here? Meekness 
speaks of spiritual and moral strength that is not self-assertive, pushy, or heavy-handed. David is an example of meekness. I wish they had a Bible read. Uh, David had several opportunities to take Saul's life. But he brought his power under control. Uh, Moses is an example of meekness. Moses challenged Pharaoh. Uh, Moses challenged the children of Israel when they were wrong. But Moses also begged God to spare them. God called him a man of meekness. Jesus is an example of meekness. Now listen, there were times when Jesus got angry. He got angry and whipped money changers out of the temple. I wish I had a Bible reader. He got angry with the Jewish leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, but he let them nail him to a cross. Because he could have come down. But he restrained his power, brought it under control to do the will of his father. And as a Christian believer, we are called upon to demonstrate meekness. Um, President Obama, with, with, with the many things I disagree with him about, one of the things I admire about him is his meekness. Uh, when, when, he, when he wants to intimidate, uh, he brings you to the Oval Office. And when he wants to tear something up, he goes to the Situation Room. And uh, he can be speaking at a correspondence dinner and killing Saddam Hussein and, and Osama bin Laden and tan up everything he wants to at the same time. And then when this man called him a liar during his State of the Union address, if I was President of the United States, I would know where he lives, who his children are, his mother, his father, and that place would be dust right now. But President Obama didn't miss a beat, he kept right on speaking, because when you got the power, you don't let folk under you make you punch down. Because all the president of the United States can do is punch down. Because everybody is down from the president. Somebody ought to help me here. If you principal of a school, you ain't got to walk around talking about I'm the principal of this school. Just be the principal. You pastor of a church, you ain't got to pop your suspenders talking about I'm the pastor. Just lead the congregation. Have I got a witness here? If you're the man in your house, you ain't got to get up every morning telling them I'm the man in my house. Go to work. Pay the bills. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Be responsible and everybody will know who's in charge. Meekness is power under control. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 32 says, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his own spirit is better than he that takes a city. When you are meek, it flows from humility. All of it emanates from, all of it stems from humility. You cannot be meek, you cannot have power and bring it under control unless you're an humble person. Only people who know 
who they are can bring their power under control. Meekness. And then the next word in that line is long suffering. brothers and sisters long suffering long suffering literally means to be long tempered it's the opposite of that person who flies off the hand uh, that, that person who gets angry with the slightest provocation. When you always put yourself first, it's easy for people to upset you. Because the slightest thing hurts your feeling. Because you carry your feelings on your sleeve. So you're looking around every corner for a slight. You're looking under every rock for some perceived injustice. I don't like how she talked to me. I don't like how he looked at me. You have a hair trigger and you're ready to insult anybody who gets in your way. But the strong person is not the person who can tell everybody off. But the strong person is the one who is long suffering in everybody else's ignorance. Because what you think about me doesn't make me who I am. Because when you know who you are, People can't define you. And so you never have to worry about what people's opinions are of you. To be long suffering means to put up with a lot. You, you have to learn how to put up with a lot. Come on, talk back to me here. You, you have to learn how to put up with a lot. Because you don't know when God is getting ready to turn it around. And you may give up too soon because you don't have a long-suffering disposition. Slow to get angry. You don't have a hair trigger. You don't have a short fuse. You, 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 can't, you can't be easily upset. Because if folk know they can easily upset you on every opportunity, they will easily upset you. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this to us before, that Jim Brown, who was one of the greatest football stars uh, in the history of professional football, was always the last one to get up from a play and get back to a huddle. And he was asked at his retirement, why was it that he was always the last one to get up and get back to the huddle? He said, because many times I was hurt and I couldn't let the defensive line know where I was hurting. Had I done that, they would hit me in that same spot over and over and over again. You see where I'm trying to go with this, don't you? Sometimes people hurt you and they offend you and they do an injustice to you, but you got to keep on smiling. That's being long suffering. You got to keep on shaking their hand. That's being long suffering. If you have an opportunity to be nice to them, don't ever bring up what happened in that incident because to forgive means to not ever let it be a barrier in your relationship. And just like God has been long-suffering with me. Somebody ought to help me preach right here. Because God should have cut me off a long time ago. 
but he's slow to get angry. He's quick to have mercy. And just like God suffers with me, and just like God is long suffering with you, you need to learn how to put up with people just like God put up with you. You got to learn how to take some stuff. Even when you're right, you got to let them say you're wrong. You're hurt, but you get back to the huddle and play your game because you can't ever know, let them know where you're hurting because they will try to hit you there every time. Don't ever let them know you're broke. Don't ever let them know you're depressed. Talk back to me if you can. Don't ever let them know you're having problems in your family. Never let them know that you are having some struggles financially. Walk like you got money. Look like you got it all together in your life. Shout like the Lord's been good to you. And they will never know that you don't have it because you praise God like you got it. I need to I need to say to some to some 90 pound Christian in here to some little namby pamby milky toast tree hugging cry baby in here that there's some of us who have learned how to give God thanks and praise before we got what we have right now was preaching and shouting before I was driving the Mercedes. That, that's a car. That gets me from one place to another. God can take that away from me in the morning. That doesn't define who I am because I was shouting when I was driving a Buick Century. I, I need to say to some Christian who can't handle hard times. Some of us here know how to get them pliers and turn the channel on your television. And, and, and put some fall paper on your antenna. I wish I had a witness here. Somebody here knows how to keep a can of oil in the trunk of your car. And park where you don't have to back out because your transmission oil is leaking. And come to church and give God praise. Have I got a witness here? Keep your feet on the ground because you got some holes in your shoes. But God's been so good to you. And if God kept you through all of that, look how far the Lord has brought you. And if you can't praise God with what you have now, if I gave you the mic this morning, you will testify Nobody but Jesus. Nobody kept me but the Lord. You have to. One of my young, one of my young preacher friends say you got to fake it till you can make it. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Just act like you got it going on. They don't know. They don't know your light's been turned off. They don't know you don't know how to pay your rent. Because you carry on so much, they think you really got it together. They, they envious of you. They want to be you because they really think you got it. If they only knew that you're struggling just like they're struggling. But I'm not here this morning to impress you with what I have or what I don't have. I know somebody who's rich in the houses and land, and if I just hang in there and learn how to take some stuff in due course, I'll have a reward. 
long suffering. Long suffering. Just, just think about where you would be if you had stayed in it. Think about how far you'd be up the road if you were long suffering. Long suffering. And then the next word in that trilogy or in that group of words is the word forbearance. Forbearance is the first cousin of long suffering. Forbearance literally means to put up with. It speaks of our ability to be tolerant of other people. It is the ability to accept people just as they are without wanting them to change in order to be worthy of our love. It's, it's a picture of, of trying to clean fish before you catch them. We put these extraordinary rules on people that we can't keep ourselves. We make people jump through hoops to become a part of our church. And, and if the standard of rules were held to each one of us, all of us would fail the test. Because God didn't wait for you to change before he loved you. He loved you while you were still in your sin. Somebody ought to help me shout right here. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. What, what separates Christianity from all of the other religions of the world? Hinduism and the Muslim religion and, and, uh, and uh, uh, all the other religions of the world is they say, get your act together, pull yourself up, and then come join us. Uh, get out of the ditch. Get out of the mire and the circumstance that you're in and once you clean yourself up, then come meet us. But Christianity is Christ getting in the ditch with us, getting dirty where we are, helping us to clean up, and then he walks with us into the newness of life. He doesn't wait for you to get your life together. He comes to you while you're in your mess. And the further extension of that thought is even after you become a Christian, you are going to mess up. I said even after you become a Christian. Let me say that to some holy roller in here who, who thinks that once you get saved and start reading the Bible that you won't have any evil thoughts or you won't have any lustful desire. Every time I have desired to do good, evil is always present. The good that I would do, I find myself not doing. And the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man, not that I was, but that I still am. I still got some issues that God is working with. I still got some problems that I'm ashamed to talk about. I still got some skeletons in my closet that I don't want to fall out. But grace, hallelujah, forgiveness, the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all unrighteousness. No, no, no true Christian ought to ever have a problem shouting over grace. I know I don't deserve to be in here this morning. I know 
I did enough last week. I wish I had a witness here. And if you didn't do it, you thought about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 Reverend, I've never committed adultery. It was on your mind. See how quiet you got right there? No, no, if you say you have no sin, you make God a liar. Have I got a witness here? All of us have some personal struggles. All of us are still dealing with our sin nature. I wish I had a witness here. Well, let me, let me talk to the honest people in here today. I struggle every day. Sometimes I get it right. Most times I get it wrong. But thank God for grace. You might, not, you might not be able to shout over justification. You might not be able to shout over eschatological epistemology. But you sure ought to be able to shout over grace. Because everybody in here today is in here because of grace. Forbearing one another. Stop. Stop putting restrictions and barriers on your love for people. Because God loves us without restriction. God loves us in spite of denomination, color, size, bank account. None of that matters to God. Jesus loves me. This I know. Because the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. You may not care nothing about me, but Jesus loves me. And that makes me shout even when it's not Sunday morning. That makes me happy even when I'm not at Lily Grove. Somebody loves me enough to die for me. Which leads me. Which leads me to the last word in this verse. He says, with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in Love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciple. Not because you belong to Lily Grove. Not because you got a big Bible with large print. Not because you got a cross around your neck almost big as the one Jesus carried on Calvary. But by this shall all men know that you are my disciples because you have love one for another. Love. Paul tells us what it is. He says love is patient. You're going to help me close this, won't you? Love puts up with a whole lot. When you truly love somebody, you can put up with a whole lot. You know everything that's wrong with them, but you put up with it because love overlooks a multitude of, of faults. Talk back to me if you can. A, a wife knows everything that's wrong with her husband, but she loves him and she puts up with a lot. A husband knows everything that's a picadillo of his wife. But he overlooks that because love is patient. You're going to help me close this, won't you? Love is kind. Speaks to people. Even when they don't speak back. Love goes out of its way. 
because the love he's talking about here is agapeo, which is always seeking God's best for the object of the beloved. Even when that person doesn't wish you well, you wish them well. Because love is kind. And then he says love is not puffed up. It's not arrogant. I wish I had a witness here. Love, when it is real, does not seek its own way. No, no, no. Whenever God reveals his clear path, you don't want your way. You want to do it God's way. When you love somebody, you have to make allowances for other people's opinions as well as your own. Because if you are having your way all the time, then somebody is unnecessary in that relationship. Let me run that by you one more time. If you're in a marriage, if you're in a friendship, and you get your way all the time, somebody is unnecessary. You can't be the man and the woman. You can't be the boss and the employee. Somebody ought to help me here. Love is not arrogant. Love is not pushy. Uh, Paul says it like this. It does not behave itself unseemly. It's not easily provoked. It, it, it does not rejoice in iniquity. But it rejoices with the truth. I need one or two more witnesses to help me clear. It bears all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. The closest thing we can almost the closest thing we can almost get to the love of God is the love that a parent has for a child. Especially a mother for her child. That mother will say, along with the father, don't come back here. Get out of this house. That's what she'll say in the father's presence. We ain't giving you no more money. That's what she'll say in the father's presence. Get out. No more money. I'm tired. I'm sick of you. In the father's presence. Then that boy will call home and say, Mom, I'm hungry. She'll say, Boy, come by here and eat before your daddy gets home. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Now she just got through saying night before last in the father's presence, I ain't doing nothing for that boy no more. And he'll say, mama, I'm broke. She said, boy, I ain't got but $20. Come on over here and get that. Somebody ought to help me preach here. She'll go in the First National Bank and pull out $20 because she loves that child no matter what he does. Have I got a witness here? Now, if you got love like that for your child, let's square that times infinity and multiply it times eternity and that's the kind of love the father has for you and I you want to know how much he loved you it didn't happen at the Red Sea you want to know how much he loved you it didn't happen at the Jordan River you want to know how much God loved you it didn't happen at David's table with Mephibosheth you want to know how much God loves you it didn't happen in the lion's den with Daniel. You want to really know how much God loves you? It didn't happen in the fiery furnace 
with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You really want to know how much God loves you? It didn't happen at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. You really want to see God's love for you? It didn't take place when all the stores were closed and there was a little boy with two fish and five loaves. You want to know how much God loves you? It didn't happen in the fourth watch of the night when Jesus came walking on the water. You really want to see how much God loves you? You've got to come with me to a place called Calvary. You got to come with me to a cross on a hill called Calvary. And I want you to see Jesus now dying on the cross. He would not come down to save himself. He decided to die to save you and me. We were lost and on our way to hell. But God sent Jesus to take our place on the cross. And he died the just for the unjust. He died the righteous for the unrighteous. He died. Didn't he die? But that's not the end of the story. They buried his body and put him in a borrowed grave. And he stayed right there all night Friday, all day Saturday. But you want to really see how much God loves you? The bright and early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. Is there anybody here glad God loves you? Is there anybody here thankful for God's grace? If the Lord open doors for you, help me magnify his name. If the Lord save your soul, help me glorify his name. Why don't you hug somebody? Why don't you shake somebody's hand? Tell them I'm glad to be in the service. One more time. I could have been dead, sleeping in my grave, but he kept me. Hey, he kept me even when I did wrong. He kept me when he should have cut me off. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, some of y'all act like you've been good all your life. Some of y'all trying to act like you've never made any mistakes. But there's about 300 of us who got a story to tell. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, that's why I came to shout. That's why I came to praise him. He's worthy, worthy, worthy. I know he's all right. that picked me up one Wednesday down in Eunice, Louisiana. It was grace that stood me up right here when the doctor said I should have been dead. But the Lord Jesus put his hands on me. And every time I get a chance, I'm going to thank God for his grace. 
If God's been good to you, I said, if God's been good to you, thank him for his grace. Why don't you hug somebody? Why don't you shake somebody's hand? Tell him he's been so good to me. He's been so good to me. He's been so good to me. Hey! demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us yes he did yes he did he became sin for us who know no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He took off his divinity and let himself be born and became for me what I could never be for myself. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. So he came and paid a debt he didn't owe. Jesus All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Hey! He washed it. is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's bed. Sinners plunged beneath that flood.